Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday. Before we begin, if you're new to our YouTube channel, these videos are all about answering your health-related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, health in general, diet, nutrition, herbalism, supplements, or really anything regarding health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity. The questions that we feel are gonna be the most beneficial to the group as a whole, and of course, the questions that we are capable of answering. Now, something else really great about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms. Now, if you don't have a health question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you have to do to be entered to win is simply give this video a thumbs up, Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, and then just drop any comment in the comment section below. And with that being said, let's get to this week's questions. All right, so taking a look at our first question, this question inquires about the various hormones that are involved in menopause. All right, so menopause is obviously a female condition that usually occurs in women who are more middle age or around the ages of 40 to 50. And it's characterized by the lack of a period. So usually missing a period is a sign that something's off in terms of fertility health and the hormonal balance of a female body. But when the periods are missed regularly and consistently or completely absent, this usually characterizes menopause. And it is associated with a lot of different symptoms that are all associated with general stress and aging. And other than the absence of a period, some of the common symptoms that are involved in menopause are problems of reproductive and sexual health. So the loss or lack of libido or sex drive, fertility issues in the sense of not being able to get pregnant, so an imbalance of fertility hormones or a lack of fertility hormones, as we'll discuss in a moment, vaginal dryness. There could be depressive symptoms, so a lot of nervousness symptoms, uh, so anxiety and depression or general emotional fatigue, if you will, or even physical fatigue. There's usually problems with the hair and skin quality, and there's other associated uh, conditions that are more severe, like bone loss. So the risk of osteoporosis tends to increase with menopause, but really all of these symptoms are just classic symptoms of aging or stress that are more specific to the female body. So you might consider menopause to be something that is just a symptom of stress and aging and something that is more or less natural. However, there are also plenty of women that are younger in their 20s or 30s that are experiencing early symptoms or onset symptoms of menopause or perimenopause, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case, and it's certainly not natural. Now, in terms of treating menopause, if you hop online or you ask your doctor, one of the things that you're gonna see is the relationship to hormonal imbalances to menopause. However, the mainstream or Western point of view of what causes menopause, hormonally speaking, is often backwards or inverted. So the mainstream point of view is that menopause is caused by declining estrogen levels. And if you hop online, just about every place you look, you're gonna see that estrogen levels decline with age and that's why women get menopause. However, this is completely opposite of the truth. The fact of the matter is, and as I've pointed out in various videos in the past, estrogen levels rise with age in both men and women. And not only does estrogen rise with the stress of aging, but we also have talked about how estrogen can rise just from various acute stressors, whether that's exercise stress from intense cardiovascular exercise or even emotional stress. And then of course, there's all of the environmental toxins and their major stressful effect is that they increase estrogen in the body. So a lack of estrogen is in no way the cause of menopause. If anything, having too much estrogen is one of the major contributing factors to menopause. If there is a hormone that is deficient in menopause or perimenopause, it is progesterone. Now, the word progesterone literally means for pregnancy. So not only is progesterone essential for driving all of the reproductive faculties in the body, but it also is a key regulatory hormone to estrogen and cortisol. So in other words, when progesterone becomes deficient, estrogen and cortisol are both left unopposed, and it is the excess of estrogen and cortisol that contribute to pretty much all of the pathological events you see in menopause. So for example, not only do estrogen and cortisol have major anti-fertility effects on the body, but if we look at some of the other major symptoms of menopause, estrogen and cortisol play pretty much direct roles in all of them. Now, this is something I talk about in greater detail in this video about how estrogen, cortisol, and basically stress hormones contribute to all of the nasty negative symptoms you'll see in conditions like PMS, 
which are very similar to the symptoms that you see in menopause, other than of course the absence of a period. So I definitely recommend watching that video for more information about the roles that estrogen and cortisol play in the various symptoms that you see in menopause, because a lot of the symptoms in PMS are very similar again to menopause. But to just touch on a couple of the key symptoms in menopause, Again, like I said in the first part of this video, one of the major things that you see in menopause is bone loss. So keeping in mind that the major hormonal deficiency in menopause is a progesterone deficiency. When progesterone is low, cortisol and estrogen are left unopposed. And both of these hormones directly contribute to the bone catabolism that you see in menopause. So cortisol, as I talk about often on this YouTube channel, is very catabolistic to the skin tissue, to the bone tissue, and to the body as a whole. Basically, this hormone acts in a survival sort of way to slowly catabolize our own tissue, our own reserves, to make energy to get through a very stressful period. So in a metaphor, cortisol helps the body to survive in an energy deficit, in a life-threatening or emergency state, similarly to the way that we could survive on, let's say, a savings account when we do not have income. So obviously this is not an ideal state to be in, but it's nice to be able to rely on, again, during an emergency state. But when progesterone is chronically deficient and cortisol is chronically high, this is obviously going to lead to a major deficit and it's going to eventually eat away at the entire reserve of energy in the body or it could start to ultimately break down to the body to the point of rapid or accelerated aging. And one of the major things that the cortisol is going to do is start to catabolize the bone. But again, if you look at other symptoms of menopause, things like anxiety and depression, cortisol plays a major role. If you look at the chronic fatigue, cortisol also has a very anti-energy producing effect in the body. So it impairs our body's ability to make energy. Cortisol is gonna directly have negative effects on the hair and skin, and ultimately all of the negative symptoms that you see associated with menopause. And then if you look at estrogen, estrogen also stimulates the production of a hormone called prolactin, and prolactin stimulates the parathyroid, and together parathyroid and prolactin can actually steal calcium from your bone tissue, which can accelerate the catabolism of the bone or the development of things like osteoporosis. Not to mention that prolactin is a direct inhibitor of the sex drive of fertility health and overall sexual health. So again, I could pretty much go down the line and look at all of the symptoms, all of the pathological events in menopause and tie them in to the direct elevation of things like cortisol and estrogen and prolactin. But all of these things are directly related to a deficiency of progesterone. So progesterone, like other androgens and protective hormones, the body declines with age where the stress hormones rise. So really, menopause is just one of the many symptoms of stress and aging in this way, but the way that you're gonna to wanna to go about correcting it is take a look at ways to optimize your progesterone levels naturally. So if you have menopause, you might want to look into temporarily using a bioidentical progesterone. The female body produces about 10 to 15 milligrams of progesterone daily. So using about that amount for a short period of time just to kick your progesterone levels back in balance could be very helpful. But I highly recommend avoiding bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. You never wanna replace the body's natural production, but you do wanna support it if you're experiencing a chronic deficiency. But for other natural ways to optimize the body's progesterone levels, definitely watch this video here because you'll learn that there are very simple things you can do to optimize the body's progesterone levels, uh, especially if you're younger, you know, in your 30s or 40s dealing with these issues. Herbs like KSM 66 ashwagandha have been proven to increase progesterone levels. So if you don't wanna use bioidentical progesterone, you could start off by using something like the KSM 66 ashwagandha, but also be sure to watch that video for additional herbal supplement dietary and lifestyle tips for restoring progesterone levels. All right, so taking a look at the second question, this question reads, if fish are high in polyunsaturated fatty acids, then why are they portrayed as healthy foods? So this is a really good question. It's just because there's a lot of controversy around the beneficial effects of polyunsaturated fatty acids and saturated fatty acids in general. So this is something I talk about a lot. If you were to research, you know, hop on like various medical journals, look on things like PubMed, you're gonna find probably more articles that talk about the beneficial effect of the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And as I talked about, I think in last week's FAQ, I think this has a lot to do with the fact that the polyunsaturated fatty acids have estrogenic effects, but these effects are tightly hidden by medical journals. I think because if the truth were to get out about the correlation between the polyunsaturated fats 
estrogen, and then obviously the major suppliers of the polyunsaturated fats, companies like Monsanto, other companies that produce you know, mass scales of things like corn, soy, and other vegetable oils, then there would be a lot of confusion. I think it'd really rock the boat, and it would obviously cause issues for the suppliers of the polyunsaturated fats and for the estrogen industry. So I heard this, and I'm not sure if it's 100% true, but I heard it somewhere in a documentary at some point that around the time of like the 1950s when Monsanto was just getting started, that at some point Harvard University was told to start promoting and advising the use of things like corn oil, that a cup of corn oil a day was heart healthy and health promoting to the cardiovascular system overall, and that basically it was obviously a, a paid sponsorship from probably the mass producers of corn oil and other vegetable oils. So in other words, the reason I think that fish oil and fish are promoted as healthy is for similar reasons that corn oil and canola oil and soybean oil and other vegetable oils have long been promoted as healthy, at least you know since the 1940s or 50s, since Monsanto and other, again, mass producers of vegetable oils came into the picture. And it's all due to funded marketing and research. So I think it's a marketing scheme more than anything. As I mentioned before, Big Pharma spends more money on marketing than they do research. So a lot of the times, the things we're told in the mainstream, the things that are popular and catching trend, are usually the most marketed and the most biased and lack the most science. So I think the reason that fish is considered to be a healthy thing more or less is because there's a lot of marketing behind it and a lot of misinformation. So not everybody that's telling you to eat fish is just trying to make money. A lot of the times they're just truly misinformed about the science. Because again, if you were to go on your own and start looking up the roles of polyunsaturated fats, you would read probably 100 articles on PubMed and be convinced that they're incredibly beneficial and that animal fats are awful. So you really have to dig and do your research and connect a lot of dots to make sense of it. But other reasons maybe fish is promoted as healthy is because there are some beneficial effects of consuming fish. Now keep in mind there's different types of fish too. There's fattier fish that are more warm water fish that are usually larger, so things like salmon that have a lot of, of the essential fatty acids. And then there's smaller cold water fish that have an equal or similar amount of the omega-3s and omega-6s and 9s. But then there's less fatty fish. And all these different fish contain a varying amounts of other important vitamins, minerals, and micronutrients. So for example, fish often contains important minerals like iodine, zinc, selenium, copper, things that people don't get in their diet that could be very beneficial. However, as I talk about in a video on my personal YouTube channel as to why you should never consume fish oil, ultimately the conclusion of that video is that the beneficial effects of consuming something like fish oil or fatty fish are greatly outnumbered by the damaging or negative effects. And because of the reason that you can get anything that you would want from fish in a safer, more natural way with less potential risk. So if you wanna learn more about the actual physiological effects of consuming fatty fish and what the essential fatty acids can do to your cells or your body, definitely watch that video for more information. That should give you some insight. But again, I think the basic reason it's marketed as a health food is for two primary reasons. One, the marketing and the biased research and funding of it. And two, all of the associated misinformed research with that marketing and that you know promotion of the product. So again, you could just hop online and you could be very well misinformed about the roles or the health effects of polyunsaturated fats and then therefore think that fish is incredible for you. So my tip for you is that if you're looking to reap any of the benefits from something, take a look at what it's providing and then also take a look at the other side. Well, what negative effect might it have? And do the beneficial effects outweigh the negative effects? There's always gonna be some sort of downside to pretty much everything that you do. Every gain comes with the loss. You just wanna make sure that it's balanced proportionately where there's more gain to loss or more good than harm, if you will. So again, when I think of the consumption of fish as a health food, the thing is that shellfish, things like oysters, mussels, crab, shrimp, can provide all of the micronutrients that you'd want and the, the minerals that you'd want from a lot of fish just with a significantly less amount of the inflammatory, toxic, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And then if you're looking at fish for some of the potential anti-inflammatory effects, you know, getting regular sunlight, getting adequate D3 exposure, 
taking vitamin K2 in a supplement or taking vitamin K2 through you know, grass-fed, pastured dairy products or something along those lines could be a safer way to get any sort of anti-inflammatory effects than relying on the consumption of fish, which is, again, probably loaded with other heavy metals and very high in the toxic polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I'd recommend just sticking to shellfish, good quality, wild caught shellfish if you can, and then just you know take a look at the rest of your diet and lifestyle. The basic things you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you're getting enough of the fat soluble vitamins. And if you're consuming organic pastured animal products, meat, dairy, eggs, etc., then you're gonna get all those nutrients from there. And just try to get shellfish or prefer shellfish over fatty fish. That's at least my opinion when you look at and weigh out the various effects that these things can have in the body. But again, be sure to watch that video. I think you find a lot of helpful insight and it might answer your question in a bit more detail about the damaging effects of that food, but hopefully this answered your question overall. All right, guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. Remember, if you're interested in winning some free herbs or mushrooms, all you have to do is give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already, and just leave your comments and questions in the comment section below. Also, for any of you interested in learning more beyond our YouTube channel, we do offer a blog, an online tonic herb shop, and an online wellness academy, all with wonderful additional information and resources, which you can find in the description box below.